Hello, this is Hushang Amir Ahmadi, a distinguished service professor at Rutgers University and president of the American Iranian Council. In this video, I will discuss what is known as state collapse and apply that particular concept to the Islamic Republic of Iran about how or why states collapse, there are different conceptual frameworks. I will just point to a few. To begin with, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, living around 300 some BC, argued that democracies usually lead to aristocracy, and in which a bunch of aristocrats take over and the majority become poor and the conflict between the two becomes inevitable. At the same time, aristocrats tend to become corrupt and incapable of managing and therefore democracies could collapse unless, he said, there is a separation of powers that there are checks and balances that will prevent, for example, the executive branch from becoming aristocrat and corrupt, controlled by, the, by a legislative power and a judiciary system. Another Greek philosopher, Polybus or Polybius, lived around 200 BC, maybe a little bit later. He also followed a similar line using different terminologies. He said that states usually have a life cycle like democracy, he said, and then he said oligarchy, dictatorship and then absolutism or tyranny and finally collapse. Uh, another important uh, gentleman on this issue is Ibn Khaldun of Tunis or Tunisia. Ibn Khaldun, uh, uh, Islamic historian, he observed that that empires or states appear, become senile, then they become basically what he said. Uh, dictatorial, selfish, and then gradually move in the direction of becoming very greedy. And then diversions happen within the state and the state collapses. Again, the interesting sort of threat that brings all of this together is that the state starts from a, a, a good place and gradually moves toward something more uh, dictatorial and tyrannical, corrupt, and then collapse comes. Of course, unless before these processes can take place, can hold within the state, checks and balances come in and correct the process. But in most cases, particularly in non-democratic societies, non-democratic states, that checks and balance can't solve the problem. So the states 
in these societies inevitably collapse. Now, the estate collapse is a long process. It's, uh, it's gradual, could be generational, and it could start with very small changes, then gradually those changes and gaps become bigger and bigger. The key to that process is that from the beginning toward the end, when the collapse arrives, the guy or the guys in power on the top become increasingly tyrannical. That is not just dictatorial, but absolutist. Tyranny develops. that the system becomes this, the voice of one person or a very small group, often one person. Usually, a state in such a situation can collapse if some trigger points develop. It could be a defeat in a war, it could be a coup, the people's revolution, or some other failed situation or a foreign invasion. Any of these triggers can lead to a state collapse. Now, generally speaking, States that come to the point of collapse, they usually have two ways to go. One, they are not capable of making change and they just stay with the failed process until they actually collapse. A revolution comes, for example, or a coup develops. But there are other states, there has been other states, that when they come to the point of collapse, they make changes. Two ways they can make changes. One way, they usually bring a radical reactionary group supposedly to take over and solve the problem. This particular pathway usually can delay the collapse but cannot prevent it. Sooner or later, the collapse will come because those who have come to solve the problem are not independent thinkers, they are servants of that tyrant. The se another way, the second way to solve or to prevent the collapse is to negotiate with the opposition that has developed to the state and manage a transition, a negotiated transition to a different new state. In recent history, we have had both of these examples, states that have collapsed, incapable of, because they were incapable of making that negotiated transition, like the Shah of Iran, or states that when they came to the point of collapse, did negotiate and let the transition to a new system like in Poland, Brazil, 
South Africa, South Korea, Portugal, and a few other places. With this introduction, let me take you to Iran and tell you what is happening there with the Islamic Republic. And I'm particularly interested in connecting that to the U.S.-Iran relations. Before I focus on the Islamic Republic, let me remind you what happened 41 years ago in Iran to the Shah Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, the king that was reigning before the Islamic Republic. This young man, this man, Muhammad Reza Shah, assumed power almost in the beginning of the World War II after Allied invaded Iran and they deposed the king who had become a dictator and was leaning toward supporting Hitler. His son replaced him, a young man, and Iran, which was up to that point, under the grip of Reza Shah, the dictator, suddenly became a semi-democratic state. The young king was open, foreign educated, and let the democracy by default to flourish because the system had collapsed. For almost between 12 to 15 years, depending on how you count it, Iran experienced sort of a semi-democracy. Then came the Shah's desire to control. At the same time, the Iranian people under the leadership of Prime, Muhammad, Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh started a national movement to nationalize the Iranian oil. That was a movement against British uh, oil company and Britain. That movement, the nationalist movement, ended with the 1953 coup against the government, Mossadegh collapsed. The Shah who had escaped the country was returned back home. And the coup had been assisted by the British intelligence and US CIA. And of course, certain officers in the Iranian the army who were loyal to the Shah. Thereafter, the Shah gradually became dictator. So, from a, a, a democratic man, gradually he became semi-democratic and then became dictator after 1953 coup. At that point, the Shah still, as a dictator, tolerated a two-party system. There was uh, the Iran and Novin party and the Mardum party, the People's Party, and the, and the new, and the modern Iran party. The two parties competed. At times, competition was engineered. Nonetheless, there was some division and some sort of uh, expression of opposition within the 
the system. Beginning in 1970s, and particularly after the oil price quadrupled, the Iranian revenue increased significantly, the Shah of Iran gradually moved from dictatorship to tyranny, to absolutism. He moved to a one-person rule. He demolished, abolished the two-party system, created one party called the Stakis, and uh, he said that is the party, the only party, the government party, and, and there is no other party allowed. That movement basically closed every little window that existed in the political system. Gradually, everything got closed. Shah's tyrannical rule toward the end of 1970s led to a revolution which ended in 1979 in his collapse. In the process of that revolution, Shah tried to change his, you know, his, his prime ministers, new cabinets were formed, martial law was imposed, all kinds of attempts were made to maintain that status quo. At the end, the Shah gave up, left the country, the army, the Sabak, the secret police, that is, the guard, the Shah's guard, and others all, and the court, they all collapsed after the Shah left the country. Now, the Shah's collapse came exactly when he became a tyrant and closed all the windows for any political dissent. But at the same time, the Shah's government, who had overspent from that oil revenue, that sudden oil revenue, got deep into economic crisis. The economy became a mess. He could not manage it. So that crisis with the, the tyranny led to his collapse. Now, the Shah could have negotiated a transition, but unfortunately he did not. Why did he fail to negotiate? Because the Shah had become a tyrant, an absolute ruler, closed mind, egoistic, self-centered. He could not even think that the people in the streets are actually Iranians. <laughs> He thought they are foreigners because in his view, every Iranian loved him. That is the illusion of power, the illusion of being loved. But that story is now over. The country was taken over by the Islamic Republic, Imam Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, a grand Ayatollah. <clears throat> Again, the cycle 
with the Islamic Republic started in exact the same way with the Shah. In the original years of the Islamic Republic, there was a free society, relatively speaking, after the collapse of the Shah's dictatorship, in fact, absolutism, the society had become quite free. They used to call it the spring of freedom. Unfortunately, that democratic stage was short-lived. Saddam Hussein invaded Iran. The radical students took over American hostage. And this two development led or gave a group of radical clerics the opportunity to gradually take over state levers and powers and monopolize them. So the Islamic Republic gradually moved from a revolution of people to a system of oligarchies, a few that would control the state. This oligarchy lived for a while until Mr. Khamenei was able to gradually take control and dominate other oligarchies and become dictator. Party system were not originally allowed, but they still allowed dissent, the reformist, the principalist, and so on, were active. This process continued until, until around 2000. 10, 11, around that area. In the last 10 years, a little bit, probably even more, Mr. Khamenei gradually took the dictatorship and made that into an absolutist system, a tyrannical system, meaning he eliminated almost every opposition and he would not even allow the reformists to participate in the parliamentary election. Now, everybody is a servant, a subservient to Mr. Khamenei. The man has become an absolutist power very much like what the Shah became in mid-70s onward for the last five, six, seven years, particularly. Now, as I said, the Shah, when arrived at that point, he just simply tried to control and to eliminate the opposition and failed to negotiate, recognize the opposition. A similar process is taking place in the Islamic Republic now. Dissent is not allowed, except for those who, in the last analysis, are loyal to the absolute power. Now, I believe, therefore, the Islamic Republic has, has been experiencing what the Shah of Iran did before it, and now the Islamic Republic may be at the point where the Shah was 
just a few years before his system collapsed. He failed to negotiate a transition to a different Iran. It is possible that the Islamic Republic will also fail to negotiate a transition to a new Iran and collapse. I have argued strongly that the Islamic Republic must allow for this negotiated transition or else it will collapse. There is no third alternative. Collapse or negotiated transition. Will the Islamic Republic follow this? We need to see. One thing the Islamic Republic has done, as previous theoricians had suggested, that it has brought a group of radicals, military and others, in the name of the second revolution or second step to the revolution many meaning that they are trying to use this radical to give the people the impression of a radical change that is coming well whether that radical change will come or not we have to see it's doubtful that it will because the group that now controls, for example, the judiciary, the legislative, and the group that will soon take over the executive, they will be all people of Mr. Khamenei's following. I don't think there is anybody there that can question his authority. And the fact is that when states come to the point of collapse, two developments can happen. One, people, a group of people, a large group of people become subservient, but a small group become courageous, outspoken, walks out of the paradigm and demands paradigm shift, regime change. In Iran, this is happening as we speak, that the opposition to the Islamic Republic has grown bigger, stronger, more radical, calling for regime change. And I would say a few among them are very courageous as well. Although we still are looking forward to more courageous leaders. But some are gradually appearing in the society. Now, alongside that, another development should concern the Islamic Republic, and that is its increased animosity and tension with the United States and its allies, Israel and Saudi Arabia, and among others. States that are in the point of collapse, that collapse could speed up, could be helped, assisted by outside forces. The U.S. has maximum pressure policy on the Islamic Republic. And the regime is really is suffering, suffocating actually, because it just can't manage 
foreign relations, foreign trade, domestic economics, or anything. An economic collapse is just about there. Iranian economy has been in a recession for almost 10 years. In the last 10 years, the, Islam, the, the economy of Iran has grown at 0%. At the same time, population has grown at about 15%. What an income decline. At the same time, poverty, unemployment, inflation, you name it. So you have this foreign pressure and the domestic economic condition that can also speed up the collapse of this absolutist power. As I said, in the meantime, the opposition is growing courageous, outspoken, and demanding change. There seems to be no alternative but either collapse or a negotiated settlement. My hope is that a negotiated settlement will develop, that the United States and others will help Iran with that negotiated settlement because a collapse in Iran will mean a disintegration of the state, not just economically and politically, but also territorially. It will create a mess in the Middle East. That collapse will immediately spill over into the region and it will destabilize the Middle East. It will take some time for that collapse to get recollected into a state. But by then, the impact will be felt throughout not just the region, region but, but also globally. The United States has a, I think, has a national interest in making sure that the state doesn't collapse, but it is forced to negotiate a transition. In my view, Mr. Trump, whoever may take his place later on, must make sure that they support a negotiated transition in Iran. Supporting a regime change in, in terms of collapse is not the right course of action. Nobody will benefit from it. Israelis, Arabs, Americans, Europeans, they will all lose. Because, as I said, a collapse of the sort that I, can, I am anticipating will also lead to Iran's disintegration. So my two cents advice to President Trump and others is that if you are staying with the maximum pressure, make sure that the maximum pressure leads to pressure on the regime to negotiate with its opposition, a transition to a new state. That you should not move that maximum pressure in the direction of making the regime collapse or fail. Everybody will benefit from that transition if negotiated well. Everybody will lose from a collapse that will lead to Iran's disintegration. Unfortunately, the Iranian government at this point is not in the mindset of a negotiated transition. Dictators 
absolutist tyrants tend to stay put until they collapse. That is very possible. But what I am saying is we all have to watch and make sure that things change. That collapse is, is nobody's, is, is in nobody's interest. That's my belief. And I think history will prove if it happens that I was right. Thank you for listening.